Welcome to Security Weekly News. Today we're doing a really old Vault episode from the Secure Digital Live show called Quantum Computing. Uh, it might actually be funny. Uh, this episode's from 28 January 2019, and Russ and I are talking about quantum. So enjoy this, and we'll see you next week on the Security Weekly News. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Welcome to Secure Digital Life. If your users are going to keep putting risky stuff on your machine, you're screwed. So, tough can help us understand the, the complexity of blockchain. I was reading through the show notes, man. Oof. In binary, it would be zero, zero, one. Uh, who cares? But <laughs> it's probably not significant anyway. You're like you're looking out through the howl dot, you know, like, oh. hey, Dave, Dave. It's like Sim, but with, you know, It would be like I Sim. Instead of only, it's only. I. Uh, well, this one's kind of tough. So if you thought blockchaining was complicated and weird, quantum computing is, well, quantum that, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. So if, if we want to talk about quantum computing, we have to try to start talking about what, what, what it means. And, and mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't think that, that it's... Uh, there's probably some humans that can actually like visualize what quantum actually means, but I think for most people it's just this sort of... It's like we were talking earlier, it's like an imaginary number. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you don't really understand it. You just have to stick it into the equation and hope mm -hmm. that it works, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I'm that's not how I understand it. And I, I mean, I have a background in chemistry, and and we were only able to unpack it on an esoteric level. I mean, for practical yeah, I mean, or pragmatic, it wasn't, you know. Uh, so I mean, so part of it is is just the difference in 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 quantum and classical <laughs> computing. Yep. So I mean, to some degree, it's not that different. It's just bigger. Yeah. So and the reason I, I introduced that stuff about Univac was because, you know, back when Univac first started, people were talking about how you're, you're not going to see these changes coming as fast yep. as they actually did yep. in, indeed start. And Moore's Law started kicking yep. in and you see these like, you know, now it's at 18 months or something. Yep. We're like doubling. And, and quantum really it's not just about being bigger though and it's not just mm -hmm. about being faster but mm -hmm. but it kind of is mm -hmm. I, I mean at the end at the end result mm -hmm. it really is just about getting to the the solution faster yeah. it's just how you get to that solution that gets so weird and crazy yeah and if you want if you want sort of a primer on it um richard feynman who's one of my favorite um scientists gave um uh, uh, an extensive lecture series uh, at caltech in the 60s and you can buy um, the videos of this talking about the difference between classical and quantum uh, mechanics, which is kind of what we're going to be talking a little bit about today on a very, you know, rudimentary level. But check out that it's on Amazon. They were just rebound, uh, beautiful mm. presentation, about sixty and, bucks. And I and I put links to IBM has a site dedicated to the Q, which is their quantum mm -hmm. computer, and they had a ton of videos and yep. stuff on there. Plus, as well, and the links in the show notes for that one, and, and you can actually go to that site and and write quantum programs at a very low level. Oh, low, yep. So they're they're literally <laughs> like. Like, like below assembler level like coding so it's like gate coding and it's it's yep. really really but if you want to start learning about it or thinking about new yep. ideas but so the basic idea of quantum that, that I kind of summed it down to was the idea that 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 something could exist in all these states at mm -hmm. the same time mm -hmm. and and that was what quantum really relates mm -hmm. to is, is that if you could see the entire thing mm -hmm. You, you could actually solve problems very, very fast because, and the, the best example, I, I looked at all these examples, I, I literally spent a whole bunch of time on this. Uh, usually, you know, I write the show in the car on the way over here, like, so that's why there's all those swears at people for cutting me <laughs> off in traffic in the show notes. But, but I mean, I, I, I literally spent a bunch of time on this because it's such a complex topic and and it's re and I see there was one on IBM where they were like we explained it to a child we explained it to an undergrad we explained it to a grad student a professional and and it was like and and they never even then really explained it I mean I mean they they sort of gave some examples and basically said yeah there's this magic box and you know at the end of it the result comes out right. but the best uh, thing I, I saw that sort of summed it up was if you had a maze you know like one of those maze games and and you started in the middle and you had to find your way out. If you I, imagine you could see the whole maze from above mm -hmm. at the beginning and you could see all of it, 
and, and you could go through the walls and you could break all the rules, you could very quickly find the solution because you could see all the possible outcomes at, at the same time. And so instead of having to do classical computing, which was going through and saying, does this work? No, does this work? No, does this work? No, does this work? No. Mm -hmm you could just literally go, okay, there's the answer. And, and it was so fast by being able to do that. And, and that, 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 was, that kind of did it for me in terms of at least sort of vaguely understanding. Even then, it's, it's kind of hard to conceptualize. Well, what do you mean? You can understand, you can see the whole problem. Right. But you kind of do that too. I mean, I mean humans kind of can enter these uh, pseudo, it's, it's not a real quantum state, but a pseudo quantum state mm -hmm. where you're looking at this whole layout and you can, you can solve this bigger process. I still think it was it was pretty mind mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, it, it it definitely was confusing. I think one of one of the things that you're talking about that maybe we should explain a little bit is sort of uh, these these quantum states is, and we're going to get to what they are, sort of. Um, but an overview, the maze, I think, is a wonderful example. Um, and the maze represents sort of the 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 variety of states that a particle, if you can, in right. a quantum state, uh, can can possess, and it's more than just um, you know, charge, uh, velocity, right? Which we'll get right. to when we talk a little bit about Heisenberg, uh, but charge velocity, but it also includes like spin and states of super, uh, or sub subatomic particles like quarks, you know, up, down, left, right, strange, right. charm, that exactly. kind of thing. So, so getting down to the subatomic level, um, you know, is, is that sort of overview of the maze, but getting to that level is the big problem yeah. right now. And understanding it and, yeah, and, and, trying to exactly. and trying to create something like that. So yeah, yeah a lot of this stuff came out of physics. In fact, mm -hmm. all of it came out of physics. Mm -hmm. and, and it started a long time ago in the 19th century with Planck and Heisenberg and all these guys. They were starting ta looking at light. Light, yep. And they were trying to understand light. And, and, and there's this really, really cool thing called, called Young's experiment. It's also called the double slit experiment. And it's, okay, yeah. and it, you added that to the, to the notes. Mm -hmm. uh, the double slit experiment or Young's experiment. And, and this was essentially where this guy took a laser and, and shined it at these slits and pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about light is made up of photons, mm -hmm. and there's, there's, there's two paths or five paths or whatever. Obviously, the photon chooses one of those paths, right. but you could see it on the other side. Yeah. Uh, through all the slits, you see five slits, and it's like, wait, now, wait, now, so which photon chooses which slit that goes through? Yeah. And it just fried people's brains. I mean, even these, like, physicists were, like, going, oh, no, no, it's not good, you yeah. know, and it was just kind of like, you know, they're setting themselves on fire and running out of the room. And it will freak you out if you start thinking about it like that, because it's just kind of like you're, you're watching this, so you're seeing photons. Yeah. Which photons are you seeing? Yeah. I mean, I mean, and, and this, this, of course, starts leading into the idea of entanglement, which was this thing that, that, mm -hmm. that Einstein called spooky action, uh, spooky action yeah. and all this weird stuff where these particles are actually associated with each other. And so when this particle does something, that one yep. does it too. And it was like, yep. uh, you've seen that. And if you read sci-fi, you've seen people talk about like faster than light radio. Mm -hmm. and, and that was how they could communicate by using these spooky, uh, the spooky entanglement yep. things. And it's like, uh, and you start watching these experiments. And you can find tons and tons of YouTube. Yeah videos about people doing this this Young's experiment with the light shining through the, the slits. And that was one of the bases for uh, the idea of quantum, wh yeah. was that light behaved like a wave sometimes, it behaved yeah. like a particle Versus sometimes. A part yeah, and, but when does it happen? And that was the right. thing. And, 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 the, and the experiments, people got out of the experiment that it only happened when it behaved like a wave when it was observed and it behaved like a particle when it wasn't right. kind of thing. So that's what the whole part of, anyway, of And, the, and that's where the was. Copenhagen thing comes mm -hmm. in. And, and that's th that, that more commonly is called Schrodinger's cat. Mm -hmm. And you hear people reference Schrodinger's cat all the time. I have some, I could not find, I was, I'd have a shirt somewhere that's got a Schrodinger's uh, I, cat. I thought you would. But, I know, yeah. and I couldn't find it, so I wore the Terrell shirt. But yeah. um, So Schrodinger's cat was this, this weird thing called the Copenhagen interpretation. And these people were talking about, and, 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 in, and in no way should you consider putting cats in boxes. They won't like it. You'll probably suffer, and it could hurt the cat. So please don't actually do this. And, 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 and uh, this, the idea of this was that, that it was a thought experiment. Yeah. So it was called a Gedanken experiment, which, mean, which means thought experiment. In German. Um, yeah. yeah, but it sounds cooler in German. Yeah, Gedanken, Gedanken experiment. Gedanken. I mean, you uh. paint that on a door in a building, and people are going to want to know what's <laughs> oh going on. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. the Gedanken experiment. Yeah. Ach, Achtung, Gedanken experiment. Yeah, Gedanken experiment. <laughs> Zima. Like, mm, we got to look in there. So you'll get your lock picks out and start, you know, seeing if you're going to get turned into a superhero. Because oh, I don't know what yeah. happens. When you get exposed to a radioactive cat, I, well, I guess you could become cat, <laughs> cat person, yeah. cat yeah. woman. Gedanken man or something. Yeah, Gedanken man. Yeah. So you can, like, do what? Lots of thought experiments. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, Rodan. 
mm-hmm. like the most boring superhero yeah, movie of all no. time. It's yeah, like, let me think about it. Just a guy Look sitting, at him think. just sitting in a room, going, yeah. mm, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I don't, <sighs> but. But but Schrodinger anyway did not really like this because he was he said you know you, this stuff would never work on something as big as a cat it was all about particles but anyway the idea of Schrodinger's cat is that and this is quantum so you you have a cat and you have a radioactive vial and you have a hammer and there's this detector that this radioactive isotope decays over a period of like I think it was like an hour and so if it decays. The hammer breaks a glass of, of cyanide and the cat dies. Cat dies and, yeah. and, and if you do that out on a table, mm-hmm. like some whacked out experiment for the cosmetic industry or something, mm-hmm. um, basically that is classical. Yeah. Because you can predict the outcome. You can look at it and you can say, well, the cat will live or it will die. And here's the likelihoods and all these mm-hmm. kind of things. But the problem was if you take that whole experiment and you put it inside of a box and you put it in a vacuum and no one can see it, yep. when you put it in, that's classical. Mm-hmm. But when you close when the you lid of the it box, yep. it becomes quantum. And, yep. and Schrodinger's cat Gedanken experiment was about now you don't know. The cat is effectively alive and dead. All states are achieved inside the box. Mm-hmm. Now, the minute you open the box, you have observed it. Yep. And the minute you observe it, it becomes classical again. So it drops out of the quantum state and it becomes yep. affected by that. And this is exactly how quantum computing actually works. Mm-hmm. So you have a classical state where you've set up a problem. Mm-hmm. There's this quantum thing that's going on where all states could po- be possible inside this magic box. And then when you open the box to see the answer, yep. it drops back down into classical. theoretically yeah. the answer, which is in back in classical space that yep. we could all understand. And I mean, and that, that Schrodinger's cat thing is kind of uh, the bottom line of it. Mm-hmm. And it makes, I guess, an answer come out. And the part for me that's hard is, is this part inside the box. Mm-hmm. And that's the part that's hard for everyone because <laughs> no one can really fathom this sort of, the you know, I mean, the cat is alive, the cat is dead, whatever yeah. happens, happens. And it, But until you observe it, it none of it happens. It's yeah. just sort of sitting in this quantum state, yeah. which is really and, weird. And I remember back in chemistry when I was taking PCAM, one a more sort of practical application of this was calculating, uh, in Heisenberg uncertainty principle, calculating both the velocity and location of a particle, and you can't. And so we had to come up with complex differential equations like psi squared, and the mi- the minute that you targeted uh, an electron or particle's position um, in, its, in its state, uh, then you couldn't uh, detect its energy, and the minute that you detected its energy, you couldn't locate it on the in within the within the particle. It was as soon as it's observed, it sort of changes. So right. that was that was the, sort of the the practical application of that. And so one of the modern things wave, wave functions they were called. right. Yeah. So w- w- wave yeah wave look up wave functions. Mm-hmm. And you'll be you, if you didn't know Psi Greek squared. if you didn't know Greek letters, you will now. Yep. Um, but basically, where this sort of quantum thing started being talked about a lot by people out in the public was in terms of RSA encryption. So RSA is a really, really common uh, type of encryption that's used all over the place, and it's based on uh, factoring very large numbers using Fourier transformations. Mm-hmm. So the idea of this encryption is not that it's, it's sacrosanct, it, it's that it's just really, really difficult to do. Mm-hmm. And so one of the initial sort of Gedanken experiments about RSA encryption that got people sort of worked up about this was the idea that if you could somehow do quantum computing techniques on this and you could co- measure the, the whole thing turns into measuring these waveforms mm-hmm. so it's back into the yeah it's Wave back into a lot yep. of math yep. but the idea of the quantum state for the quantum computing that would break rsa encryption was by just being able to factor a crazy giant number really, really fast using what is called Shor's algorithm. So Shor's algorithm is a classic algorithm for factoring numbers. Mm -hmm. And you can look it up and and you can write classical computing applications of it. The problem is that doing all those Fourier transformations takes a really, really, really long time Mm -hmm. because you're doing one, nope, that didn't work. This one, nope, didn't work. This one, no, didn't work. And of course, if you could find a way to code that better, Mm -hmm. so this is is back in the computer science, if you as a programmer could find a better algorithm, then maybe it would be called your whatever your name is, algorithm. And you could be the next famous computer science person who wrote a better way to factor numbers. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, but sure, his algorithm is widely used. Mm-hmm. With quantum, you could see all the states. Yeah. 
at one time, and therefore you could find the solution by measuring the difference between the waveforms. And, and, and this is called interference in mm -hmm. quantum states. And so the, the best example I saw of interference in quantum states was about noise-canceling headphones. Yep. So Russ has some really posh headphones. I have some cheap ones, but he has really fancy. You have some fancy ones. I'll yeah, see you wearing but them. I mean, yeah, okay. I thought they were going to take them away from you in Israel. <laughs> They were holding them up. Oh, like, I, was so, I was so angry. Yeah. Like, these are nice headphones. These are like, $350. You're possibly not you're them. a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, we'll be putting yeah, I hide on. my drugs in here. Yeah, exactly. But uh, noise canceling headphones work by taking sound waves and creating sound waves that are the opposite of those sound yep. waves. So they, they, they just cancel each other out. Uh, this is exactly how a Cat5 cable works. So a twisted cable mm -hmm. works by canceling out the electrical interference with, yep. a, with a similar way by wrapping the wires yep. around each other. So you, you just lay them on top of each other and cancel out. Yep. So there's two kinds of interference, though. That, that, that one is canceling it out. Yeah. The other one is called amplification. Yeah. So you can also cause the waves to boost. So mm -hmm. the way they were looking at quantum computing in the Gadonkin experiment of, of computing was that if you amplify the waveforms of solutions that are good mm -hmm. and you cancel out the waveforms of solutions that are bad, you can effectively create one that's just a flat line and it mm -hmm. goes away mm -hmm. and one that's really good. And so the, again, this is this quantum thing that's happening in this magic box. And, and, and that and then meant that you could do this massive solution yeah. to this Shores algorithm very, very, very quick. And I don't mean like quicker. I mean, like, super so quick, quick yeah. that it was insane. Yeah. It was like, you know, oh, because right now to crack RSA encryption with, you know, X computer, mm -hmm. it's going to take like a billion years. So yeah. you just take some computer and say, okay, it's going to take a billion years. Mm -hmm. With Univac 1, it would take 100 billion years. Like, it, the universe would expire yeah. before Univac 1 could, could do it. It could do it. It's just going to take a really, 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 really long time. And what, what you'll under, what you'll get to when you start studying some of the or looking at some of these videos on on quantum versus classical is you, you you don't arrive necessarily at definitive answers anymore. As Doug stated, you know we're, we're looking at these 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 uh, amplified uh, waveforms, which are known uh, in quantum uh, as probabilities. So instead of looking, you get these things called probabilistic functions, right. and you want to maximize uh, your probability to get at the most uh, legitimate answer right. versus and minimize the, the the least probable so you can sort of discard those so that's you're not arriving at definitive answers anymore now it's probability based. and and so it, it's a couple of references uh, oh, on heart of gold yeah. if you know what heart of gold is uh i don't know is it the movie? guide of the galaxy Oh, it the name I've of, read it like It was the times. name of Zaphod Beeblebrox's uh, ship was the uh, Heart of Gold. Oh, okay. It was, a right, right, it was right. an right. infinite probability drive in it, the ship. Yeah. That's, and, that's and, it, yeah, infinite probability. And it was a, it was yeah. a quantum drive, yep. essentially yep. is what it was, because it was yep. computing all possible yep. po probabilities at every given moment. And so the Heart of Gold was actually using a quantum drive to propel itself yep. through the universe to some probability, which is what you're talking yep. about. You get to the most likely solution, and again, you amplify things up, right. and by amplifying the good ones up and keeping the other mm -hmm. ones canceled out, you get to the best possible probability. Now, remember, that's the quantum part. But then when you open the box, yep. boom, the box opens, and one thing, and it settles down back into classical state, and that's, that's the end of that. So that is sort of the, I guess, an attempt to describe what quantum computing actually does to some degree. It looks at massive numbers of probabilistic states. Mm -hmm. it, it can do all those things simultaneously, so it can compute things through this matrix simultaneously. And by doing that, you can end up at some point where you have the most likely solution, and it drops out. So what does this mean for RSA encryption? Well, it means that instead of Univac 1 taking a billion years, or Marvin the robot sitting on Earth for a billion years <laughs> waiting on the future to catch up, um, we'll use some Hitchhiker's references oh, today. okay, now, yeah. What happens instead is that we open the box and everything gels down into the classical solution, and now we actually have the highest probability solution, and that means that that RSA encryption could be broken almost instantaneously. Now, don't fret. So this is, of course, the ooh kind of thing that gets headlines. But the reality of that is, is one, all of the quantum computers on Earth today, and again, this is why I talked about Univac, all these computers on Earth today basically have very, very, very small computing power. Mm -hmm. Uh, compared, compared to quantum. You know, yeah. yeah, compared to, but they're quantum. Right. So even the right. quantum ones don't have very much horsepower mm -hmm. because no one is able to create these states. And we'll talk about how you create these states in a second. But basically, right now, it would take a machine with a million qubits. 
I can say it. Computer generated voices cannot. I was watching a video where they kept saying quits. Qu- and it oh, also quibits. said quits, quits, yep. quits. And yep. I was like, what is he saying? But right now, the biggest quantum computers on Earth have, I think Google's is right. I, 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 this may not yeah. be current, but Google's have, uh, is called Bristlecone. Yeah, Bristlecone, yeah. And Bristlecone has about 72 mm-hmm. qubits. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you about qubits in a second, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, IBM's Q has 50 qubits. Mm-hmm. And these things are generated using superconducting materials. Mm-hmm. The one at IBM, you can see it in the video, looks like some kind of a lab. They call it the chandelier. It, it looks like a chandelier. Yep. It uses microwave pulses to alter the states. So it causes phase shifts in, in these devices. And this is how you create altered states in these superconductors. But superconducting means something very important. It means cold. So minus two seventy three point well close to minus two seventy three point one five which is absolute zero Kelvin yeah scale. and and so there it's it's really crazy yeah. what they have to do to get this to work so that yeah. means that creating more qubits is very 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 expensive mm-hmm. and very very difficult because they have to lower this thing into some kind of super cooled bath and and keep it close to absolute zero mm-hmm. or it doesn't work mm-hmm. and the state drops out if they if they gets warm so mm-hmm. hey, remember the days when we had to have giant air conditioning units to keep our mainframes <laughs> cool we're back to those days hey we had an IBM <laughs> Uh, mainframe that had water cooling. It had these big water pipes attached to it. And it was pumping water through at yeah. an alarming rate, like yeah. a fire hose, to try to keep the mm-hmm. thing cool. Mm-hmm. Same. Here we go again. So again, the reason I mentioned Univac is because even though today we say, well, there really aren't any machines that can do this at any high high scale, because uh, the thing I said that to break the RSA encryption instantaneously was going to be like a million qubits, yeah. which is not that much if you think about RAM and you think about bits. But you know what? It's a lot compared to fifty. But mm-hmm. Univac one had twelve thousand K mm-hmm. or twelve K. Uh, today we all we can laugh at that and sneer yeah. at it and say we've got two hundred fifty six gigabits yeah. uh, gigabytes in our phone. Yeah. Poor old Univac had twelve K, but uh, that happened really fast. And yeah. and so you may see them going and saying, well, we got fifty, now we got five hundred, now we you know, got five thousand, and and on and on and on. So we were talking about qubits a little bit. Um, do you know what a qubit? You, 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 it's a quantum bit. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's a bit more than just one or zero, right? I exactly. mean, it has different states. So, a classic yep. bit, which you use in a classic computer, is a essentially an electrical state. Mm-hmm. So, it's either on or off. And the way they do this is by by using alternating DC current. I mean, yep. at the at the engineering level, it's DC current and it's modulating. So, they cause it to slip over. Uh, this this threshold, some arbitrary threshold that mm-hmm. they set, mm-hmm. and if it's above it, it's a one. If it's, it's one below one. it, it's a zero. Right. So by modulating that current, they can create two states, mm-hmm. one zero. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Quantum, not so. Yeah. So let's qubits. So currently, the way they're looking at qubits are ones and zeros, mm-hmm. absolutely. But they write them differently. They put a pipe in front of it, and it, it's creating this weird symbol. It can also have rotation, mm-hmm. so it can be rotating plus one half, minus one half, right? Whatever, and yeah. so, so the, the the illustration I saw of this uh, is called Bloch's sphere, and Bloch's sphere has pointing toward the north is a, a one, I think. Pointing toward the south is a zero mm-hmm. to the pole of this this sphere, but they were saying that then then all the way around the equator are different states, mm-hmm. so this thing is spinning. So in the quantum state, in theory anyway, if you take enough qubits, you can represent all possible states. And you don't know which ones are which. I mean, it's just these probabilistic outcomes like on the heart of gold. You don't know where you're going to end up. You just hope that it's the one that's best. <laughs> it's the one that's best, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the problem with that quantum drive. On the, if, you, if, you, if you haven't read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, Do so, yeah. uh, uh, or, you, know, you, you probably don't get it, but go read it. You should. But the point is that a qubit then can have these, these multiple states. Mm-hmm. So already, just if we, if we just keep it simple and we said, okay, it's got 0, 1, and it's got right or left. So now we've got each bit can have two states, but it can also have more states because it could be going, it could be spinning to the right or it could be spinning to the left. So we've, we've added not just two more states, we've added multiples of those states. And that means that we've got a whole bunch more representations we can do with that bit. Then we can add other things to it, like up and down and all kinds of weird things. And you can go read about uh, some of the really grim weirdness that's in there. But the point is that by adding these qubits into quantum registers, because that's what we do with regular bits, we say we take, we take eight bits and put them in a register, and that's called a byte. Mm-hmm. We can take quantum bits and put them in a register and call it a quantum register, but it's not eight bytes anymore. Mm-hmm. Now it's zeros and ones in the register, but they could be 
right rotating, yep. left rotating, ups, downs, ins, outs, all kinds of crazy stuff. And all of a sudden, the number of states becomes very, very high. And by adding enough qubits, all of a sudden, we could theoretically represent just a massive, crazy number of states uh, for computing. And then we have to write algorithms that can utilize this because it would be wasted on very straightforward kinds of things. I, I mean, if we just wanted to do a simple problem that could be solved mathematically, for instance, like logarithmic regression. Well, logarithmic regression is a mathematical equation, and you can solve it a as a math equation. That's a very good classical computing example. But if we have lots of logarithmic regression problems and we want to try to solve all of them for the best one, it suddenly becomes something that quantum could solve in a different way. Mm -hmm. Likewise, Fourier transforms. If we can take all these possible factorings of some astronomically ginormous number and we can solve all those factorings simultaneously using this large number of qubits, all of a sudden that quantum computer can take the input of an RSA encryption key, mm -hmm. boom, factor that number out all those times, and when you, when you open the box, laying on the table is the best outcome, mm -hmm. just like the heart of gold. And, and you know, Zaphod doesn't know where he wants to go, so they throw it in there, and the best outcome comes up, and good luck. And you hope that you end up where you were supposed to be. No, I mean, uh, back to, I, every time you say Qubit, I think of that silly 80s game, Qbert, remember? Yeah. yeah, no, I remember you did, yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah, was uh, that's, that's not an 8-bit game, though, I don't think. Is it an 8-bit game? No, I don't think it used 8-bit. It actually 8 -bits. had graphics. It was, and it was Atari. Like, it was kind of pseudo 3D, I remember. It was yeah. an arcade game. It was, I think it was 2-bit. Um, it was an Atari game, so before Nintendo came over. Yeah. yeah, well, but anyway. Now, there are other ideas here as well, so don't get me wrong. Um, there's also the idea of, of this entanglement stuff that mm -hmm. we were talking about, about. That's the spooky um, action at a distance. Spooky action at a distance. Even Einstein had to come up with some weird explanation for it, but yeah. he, he did call it, it was called spooky, uh, spooky states and spooky mm -hmm. entanglements and all this stuff. And it, it is kind of spooky. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that we can talk about a little bit uh, about quantum computing is the idea of, and they use entanglement. Mm -hmm. So entanglement means you can link things together. So mm -hmm. if you have quantum registers that are now linked all of a sudden they can talk to each other and, yeah. and they can reflect the same values and, and that multiplies your computing horsepower or again. Or opposite. The, well, the, idea, be, yeah. is, the it, idea is that a particle, two particles are quantumly um, entangled and not locked, that's French, uh, quantumly entangled. <laughs> and, uh, and they could be galaxies, literally galaxies away. And as you adjust the state of one particle... Uh, it changes the state of the other, exactly. even if it's galaxies away. And and scientists, as of now, don't understand how that works, because how could particles... It'd be like having a walkie-talkie working a galaxy away instantaneously. Well, that's what I mentioned about FTL radio. So it was mm -hmm. like one of the problems with like space is that it's so big, yeah. and, and so sci-fi people have been trying to deal with these weird problems for a long, long time. And one of the things I had seen in sci-fi a long time ago was people talking about faster-than-light radio. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and when I first read it, the author wasn't actually mentioning quantum, but I actually thought of spooky. And I, I was trying to remember it even. I was like, what was that? Einstein had some kind of weird thing about that, about mm -hmm. these particles. And I was like, well, you know, if you had these particles and they could represent bits and the other particles could be taken 100 light years away and they would still represent the same thing, you could communicate over vast distance instantaneously. So yeah. you could watch, you know, porn on another planet. Uh, if you, you know, I mean, I guess that's a sad use of, of quantum <laughs> computing, but but so so to sum all this up, essentially what we're getting at with quantum computing is one, it's not a thing yet. I mean, it, it is in a lab, and and there are people experimenting on it, and they're working on it constantly right now to try and 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 come up with new ways to to really to build the hardware at this point, because until we get the hardware in common use it's going to be really hard for people to come up with cool new ideas with it. Now, obviously, there's classical and quantum problems that people would like to solve in labs mm -hmm. that they haven't been able to solve. But at the moment, it's not really there. So when people start telling you your network card is quantum-based, they're probably just using marketing terms. Because I can name my company Quantum Lucky Man, and Quantum Lucky Man doesn't mean that it's quantum, yeah. lucky, or a man. It's just the name of the company. And, and we've seen people doing that kind of yeah, stuff for years. There's a television manufacturer. <laughs> I won't mention the name. But uh, their technology for uh, the, 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 the modern display technology is called quantum. And they, they use quantum dots uh, to represent pixels, which is like 10 years <laughs> out, whatever. You know what, yeah, that's what exactly. they're saying. But I can call the company that <laughs> and get away with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a lot of right. fun. 
Um, one of the but I, I, one of the examples I put in the show notes was about chess, mm-hmm. and a lo- and and chess is a good a good example of a problem that has many many solutions. And and you know if you take a chess board and you look at all any position on the chess board, there are many many outcomes out there in the future. And that's what differentiates me, who is a terrible chess player, from a chess master, Bobby Fischer, or who is somebody who can sit there and look at it and visualize thirty six moves down downstream. You know just by eyeballing it. Mm-hmm. Well, I was playing this Atari. It was on an Atari back in like the late 70s. And I had a chess game on there. And if you set it on beginner, it just guessed its next move. So yeah. you could beat it senseless. It was like playing a little kid. And you could just you could do <laughs> fool's mates and stuff on it. And it was just stupid. Yeah. And on the intermediate level, it actually was using libraries of moves to try to predict these little narrow trees. Mm-hmm. But it was so slow even then that it would take five, seven minutes to make a move because it had to review all these different tree states. If you set it on hard, I have no idea why they even had that mode, but if you set on a heart, literally could take hours to even make an opening move because it had to look at so many weights. But a, a quantum version of that would be able to see that entire outcome instantaneously. So you would have a chess computer that's going to beat everybody. Before you, know, you even start playing. Yeah, it's probably going to predict your move and go, I can right. let me make that move for you because you're going to lose anyway, so we might as well just, yeah, I win. I, you know, I mean, Let's I think just that, not play. Yeah, in fact, I was, I was I actually thought about making a joke uh, website. There was a quantum computer chess player, and, and you say, would you like to play? And you hit play, and then it just immediately pops up. I win, and I was like, "That would be the quantum version uh, of yeah. that kind of thing." So there's a lot to this, and it's definitely something you should get involved in. I put links to the IBM site on uh, the show notes, yep. so you can take a look at their quantum computer. They'll even let you mess with it. Yeah, you can attempt to write cloud code. based. Yeah, it's in the cloud. I think you have to register, but it mm-hmm. wasn't. It didn't cost anything. They will mm-hmm. let you actually go in and write little codes and 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 feed them into the quantum computer. Right. So I would really encourage you to do that. Um, what I keep seeing and people saying, and of course, it's always to me naive, because uh, it's like the person that said television. Yeah, there's no future in it. Uh, and people saying it's going to be five to seven to 25 years before we actually see this in, in, in use. Given what we know at the moment, that's true. Yeah. So I think if you say, well, right as of this moment, it's probably going to be five to 10 years before you see any kind of real application of this in practical uh, in the practical world. But all it takes is that one breakthrough where somebody finds out that, oh, if you if you super cool it one degree less, it works better. And then all of a sudden, all bets are off and you go from having a tube or a valve, uh, you know, computer like Univac to having a transistorized computer, which yeah. means that all of a sudden Univac collapsed into the size of, you know, say like a car instead of a building. And then, you know, all of a sudden that becomes integrated circuitry and you go from Univac to this and of course this is so far more powerful than univac ever dreamed about being it's kind of shocking so uh, thanks russ i think russ was really helpful in this regard because he has a chemistry background um thank you for joining us or not joining us uh, we were here or we weren't here uh Both. it's not exactly clear but until you looked at us and then we were actually here at that point we became non-quantum and we went back to being just classical so thanks for joining us at sdl and we'll see you next time